Hi everyone, welcome. Um, apologies for starting late. Uh, we're really fortunate in having uh, a team from Malawi willing to share with us uh, what is going on within the um, Malawian primary health care context. Um, I think this is about us understanding better how different parts of Africa are actually working. Uh, my name is Shubhi Musa. I'm a uh, facilitator for Afro PHC, uh, president of Wonka Africa, and we hope that we can have a productive afternoon. Uh, I just want to go through quickly uh, some of the key issues. We need to just remind ourselves of the platform. So if you hover your mouse over your screen, you should be able to see settings. Please then go and check your audio if you need to. Um, question and answers, please pop them into the, uh, click on the Q&A and you should see the screen pop up and then you can add it uh, in the arrow at the bottom. Please input your questions there and add it there. You can use the chat, but please avoid using questions there. Just uh, use the chat uh, to greet, etc. cetera. Um, if you need to speak, uh, want to speak, uh, you can raise your hand. We may kind of promise that we will be able to give it to you, that opportunity, but let's see how we proceed. So with that, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. And um, I just want to say that in Africa, we have a trajectory of, um, of um, COVID that is growing. Um, South Africa remains a hotspot, and we will be sharing a little bit more about other parts of South Africa. Uh, but nonetheless, let's give a chance to um, colleagues from um, the area of, um, of Malawi. And I want to just introduce uh, the three people that are going to be speaking. Uh, it's Bente that will be leading the team. Um, in addition, we've got um, uh, Mudai, is it? Sorry, I must just get the names quickly. Patrick, I think Patrick uh, Chisepo and Mudai is with you, is it? Bente? I'm, a, I'm sorry, I didn't miss your name. Uh, sorry, Mudai Menu, Menu, Menula. So apologies, Modai. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> so, thank you all very much. I think uh, they are in the space of Malawi. So I'm going to leave it to you, Bente, to and uh, Modai, to just introduce ourselves a bit more, Patrick, as well. Um, so I'll leave it to you to, to share it. Let me just give you a co-host so you can, in fact, uh, present. I think if you want to, both of you, or if you've got, presentations, you've got the opportunity now to do that. So we'll, we'll, we'll switch off while you switch our audio and video while you present. So Bente, how will it be? Will you start? Yes, uh, I will start and I have one big presentation for all of us. Um, so I will share my screen and then we will just go through all three presentations. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you all very much and uh, welcome to all our attendees. Um, welcome, we've got uh, Presenters from Malawi, starting with Bente. Bente, you can proceed from there. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just share my screen. Um, yes, all right. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, share something about the COVID-19 response by the Family Medicine Department in Malawi. Uh, my name is Bent van der Meijden. I'm one of the uh, faculty people in, um, from the Family Medicine Department in Malawi. And with me, we will have two other people who will present. Um, first of uh, all, Morai will present. He's one of our first uh, Family Medicine registrars who is about to finish. Uh, and then uh, we will end with uh, Patrick Giuseppe, who is also a registrar in the Family Medicine um, we hope to give you an overview how COVID is affecting Malawi and what we as Family Medicine Department do. Um, I think the easiest thing will be if the questions will be in the end. Um, so we can first go to all the presentations, but please. Um, as we'll encourage said, questions. Uh, Great. And, and I think that I'll have some questions, but we encourage you to come up with questions. Uh, thank you for yeah. that. And you can proceed. All right. What we want to discuss in this um, brief presentation is what the government in Malawi did for the COVID-19 response. Um, then we want to give you an overview of what the family medicine um, department did in the response to COVID-19. And then we will end with um, 
one of our family medicine uh, hospitals, uh, Nakoma Mission Hospital, um, how, what they did for the COVID-19 to give you a um, specific uh, overview of how a hospital responds. Um, so first of all, the first case of um, COVID in Malawi was in April. We were one of the last African countries uh, to have the fir first case of COVID-19. Um, we are now one of the highest number actually in, in, in Africa, um, but we still only have 3,000, um, yeah, a bit more than 3,000 uh, confirmed cases. This was on Tuesday, so it's going up a bit more now, uh, of which more than 2,200 are local transmission. Uh, and we have 71 uh, deaths uh, of COVID-19. Um, and we now have um, a lot of uh, different uh, testing facilities, actually, where we can test for COVID. So first of all, I'm going to uh, lead you through the infection prevention measures that are taken by the government uh, on this COVID-19. Um, and it started at the end of um, March. Then the, uh, the state of disaster was uh, called out by the government. Uh, and the government announced a, a response plan of which they were asking for 20 million um, US dollars. Uh, and they started screening for coronavirus of travelers entering Malawi with temperatures and symptoms. At that time, we didn't have any testing facilities. So if they had symptoms, they would go for uh, self-quarantine. A day later, the government came with a, um, yeah, a bit more preventive measures for public services. So for banks, for the hotels, lodges, uh, churches and markets. Uh, meaning that people had to wash their hands before entering public uh, services. Uh, the members of staff in the services should wear surgical masks. They should uh, start with screening for flu symptoms with temperature and asking questions. Um, there could no, no longer be meetings with more than 100 people uh, and they should maintain one meter apart. So this was already in the end of March before we actually had one case. So at that time, you can imagine that people didn't really feel the urge to do so uh, because they could not see, uh, they, could, they didn't see COVID around them. Um, so then afterwards, one day later, they, they also closed the schools, also still before we had the first case. And then in the beginning of July, uh, they closed the borders, international flights were suspended, and there were um, uh, a lot of rules for public transport. People must wash their hands before entering the um, reduced public vehicles with seating capacity to 60%, which had a huge influence on um, public transport because the transport costs went up by uh, at least 50%. So transport was a lot more expensive. It's still a lot more expensive. Uh, and the vehicle should be disinfected uh, before every trip. So then in April, um, the government wanted to put even uh, more rules in it. They wanted to have a 21 days lockdown. Um, this, end, this ended in a lot of demonstrations um, from people who really didn't want to have the lockdown because they were afraid that there would be food insecurity. They uh, were afraid that they would not work anymore. And Malawi is really a country where people uh, only have food when they have a job really daily job that gives them uh, food supply. Um, so there were a lot of demonstrations and the high court um, blocked the lockdown. Uh, and then from the end of May, beginning of June, we saw an increase in um, COVID cases. And this was mostly because Malawians were returning from South Africa. Uh, first, it was unofficial because the, the um, borders were really closed. Um, but then um, Mal the government said, okay, Ma the Malawians in South Africa can come back. Um, and they were sending big buses um, and people could actually join uh, Malawi again. Uh, they were tested at the border site and we saw a lot of positive cases coming from there. Um, people were mostly put in quarantine centers, but those centers didn't have adequate sanitation. There was no food supply, so people were escaping the quarantine centers. Um, I went home. Um, people were encouraged to do self-isolation and should be followed up by the district response team to see if self-isolation was really uh, done. But um, yeah, you can imagine that it was difficult for the district team to really follow up every case on a daily basis. It's almost not possible. Um, 
So that's what they did on the global uh, Malawian level. And now I want to go a little bit more into depth how that was, how it was for the healthcare uh, delivery. Um, so as said before, they asked every district to develop a district rapid response team. Um, and the task for that team was to uh, prepare the districts for COVID-19, meaning that they had to come up with case detection and follow up um, guidelines and they uh, were engaged in the health promotion and really preparing the health center. So, the, so build, a, build a COVID-19 ward, uh, start triage. Um, so yeah, everything in the uh, COVID-19 management. Um, then um, the government, so the Ministry of Health also conducted a lot of trainings on COVID-19 management and infection prevention in which they trained mostly part of the DRT, but also um, other health workers who were trained as trainers. So they could train all the other health workers and supporting staff in all the health facilities, uh, which has been done. So everyone has uh, had some kind of a training. Um, and the ministry also um, assess uh, most of the, a lot of the health facilities to check on their preparedness. So they checked if there was a DRT, if there was screening and triage happening, if there was an isolation work for COVID-19, and if there was PPE available. Uh, then there was a an, um, discussion in uh, Malawi uh, in the beginning when COVID was coming, uh, when, when the sudden number was rising. Um, there were a lot of demonstration and sit-ins sit from health workers because they didn't feel safe enough to work. Um, they, were, they were not safe. They, they said that they didn't get enough um, salary to do this. Uh, there was not enough PPE. Uh, and that ended up with um, a risk allowance. Uh, so the ministry came up, came up with a risk allowance for health workers um, so, and also with quarantine facilities for health workers. So if you were working in the COVID-19 ward, that, was mean, that would mean that afterwards you can go to a to a quarantine facility for health workers where you will also get food. Um, and of course, the ministry also made guidelines. So there were guidelines on case tracing, there are guidelines on case management, and also specific for some risk groups like um, maternal, um, yeah, like pregnant women. Um, and um, they played a big role in preparing testing facilities. First, I was only on central levels, but now uh, in most districts, uh, we are able to uh, test for COVID-19. Um, in the facilities, there are also some rules um, people have to obey now. Um, so all um, health workers are asked to wear surgical uh, face masks, um, and we ask the guardians and um, patients to wear uh, cotton face masks. Um, it was asked to decongest the wards, uh, meaning that in a lot of places you saw that they don't do any elective cases anymore. Um, and um, they were asked to do more frequently ward rounds to decongest as quick as possible. Only one guardian is allowed for patients. Uh, visiting hours are limited. And um, health workers in a lot of hospitals are working in teams, meaning that they work for one week, then they're one week off to try to expose as, as less health workers at the same time to COVID-19 patients. So that was what we wanted to say about the government response. I will now give the words to uh, Dr. Modai and he will take, take you through uh, the family medicine in COVID-19 response. Thank you, Dr. Modai. Welcome. Uh, so I'm Dr. Modai. Uh, just completed uh, my postgraduate training in family medicine and uh, fresh. Uh, <laughs> yes. <A> fresh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, currently I'm also part of the part of the family medicine at the College of Medicine and the University of Malawi. Um, of course, we've seen great strides as far as the family medicine program in Malawi is concerned, uh, being part of the response for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, if we are to follow the history of family medicine in Malawi, uh, focusing on uh, postgraduate training, it dates back to six years ago when this program was started. And uh, then we started with the uh, two training sites at a district level. Uh, that was Mangoja and Nkoma Mission Hospital. And uh, the, our first group started uh, with uh, three 
postgraduate doctors. And uh, as I talk now, we are uh, about, we have about seven registrars and two of us almost completed, as I've said. Uh, in terms of the number of faculty in, the, in our department, you can see we are only 13. It's still a young department that needs um, uh, support. Uh, and I understand some of uh, uh, people who have access to this webinar, maybe already they have started to be thinking of coming down to Malawi to support the program. As you can see, there are only 13 faculty members at the moment. So we need more hands to make sure that we improve our primary health care. Uh, now the question remains is, um, was or is family medicine still relevant uh, at the level of primary health care as far as the response and the control of the 19 spread is concerned? Uh, before I go into that detail, um, I will just take you through the current health structure for Malawi and also looking at uh, uh, where are the specialists, uh, clinical specialists, and uh, where are most of our, of our patients in our country? Uh, in general, we have a, about 5% of uh, clinical specialists working in rural setting. And uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, health worker patient ratio as well as the doctor patient ratio uh, leaves a lot to be desired. We really need to strive to improve those numbers. And uh, looking at the HEPA uh, uh, system itself, you can see that um, uh, most of our primary care are formed by the health centers and the rural hospitals. And at the secondary level, we have the district and uh, as well as the mission hospital owned by the, uh, uh, which are also called the CHAM and the CHAM, uh, Patient Health Association of Malawi. And uh, we only have, as, a, as I talk, four central hospitals. But if you look at the population distribution in Malawi in general, about 85% of our population resides in the rural areas. Uh, so you need uh, to understand there that uh, if we are to invest, I mean, better to invest in a doctor that will look at the, or that will look for the 85% of the population rather than the 15% of the population. That's what we need. So. Uh, we really appreciate the studying of the family medicine program and we hope that this is uh, a program that will also improve our primary health care. But uh, moving on specifically focusing on uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, primary uh, family medicine has played a very big role uh, starting with uh, even organization uh, at the level, at the health system level. Um, it has been part of the uh, managerial positions in uh, development of uh, district rapid response teams. This is a team that is, uh, has been continuously involved in the putting measures on the ground about preventive measures for COVID-19 and also trying to uh, train local staff at district level so that they understand uh, case management for COVID-19. And also with the understanding of family medicine, having that knowledge of a health system, it has also helped to uh, mobilize resources which are relevant in the treatment and also prevention of COVID-19. Uh, not even forgetting the fact that uh, it has uh, also helped in uh, setting up screening and also triage systems at the district uh, uh, level. At the same time, monitoring and improving some of the weaknesses of uh, those particular systems. And uh, most importantly, supervision of staff and uh, also uh, not forgetting even health promotion, which is also a very important principle of family medicine. Like, as you can see in the picture on the right on, uh, on this presentation, it's uh, one of the postgraduate doctors who is being trained in family medicine at Mango Disease Hospital, teaching the community on how to prevent COVID-19 spread. And uh, in general, all that has uh, helped the district level to be, or the primary health care levels to be strengthened and to be prepared uh, to fight against the COVID uh, 19 pandemic. 
Uh, however, we've noted that uh, though family medicine uh, has done a lot of work uh, to improve on the uh, uh, to prevent and treat uh, COVID-19, however, we had seen some other changes of some other dynamics in, in terms of health service delivery. We've observed that uh, 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 there was uh, a change in the number of elective surgeries that uh, have been happening, so much so that to prevent spread of the pandemic. And also we've noted that uh, the number of admissions in, patient, uh, in hospitals have gone down. Some of the reasons that uh, we know anecdotally uh, because there was an increase uh, uh, in public transport fares, uh, just because the people want to, the the policies uh, wanted to allow people to have social distance when they whenever they take like a minibus, they are moving from the community to the hospital, and also that people maybe they are afraid of uh, uh, contracting um, uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, Due to challenges in some other funding uh, programs and some uh, other essential health services for Malawi, we've noted also vaccine, vaccine programs being challenged because of the pandemic, as well as uh, it didn't even leave out uh, the constant supply of drugs. And uh, inclusive of that were other programs that are also funded by different NGOs uh, like the malaria and the HIV. We've, thought, we've noted also uh, some of the um, resources going down whereby it ended up uh, people, less number of people being tested and also at different levels of the health system, uh, especially the central hospitals. It, it's been a quite a challenge these days to leave a patient. When you consult, you say you want to leave a this particular patient, you, you just hear that, oh, we are no longer doing that clinic at the moment, we are waiting for COVID-19. And also, even most important as far as family medicine is concerned, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, tearing down of chronic care clinics in different hospital settings. Now we had questions like, uh, uh, where are these people accessing health services? Do we even know whether they are really compliant with their treatment and what are the outcomes of those people at the moment? Those are the, some of the questions that I think at, uh, uh, as managers or as uh, leaders in primary health care, we need to start to, uh, to think about and we need to consider how we can strategize our health service delivery at this, uh, during this pandemic because it is possible that there is a certain proportion of the community that is being denied of uh, health services as a result of a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, most importantly, we've also seen a change in terms of uh, uh, training of medical students, either at undergraduate or even postgraduate level. Some of the uh, challenges is that uh, since these students are supposed to go to different hospitals, but now the hospitals are not fully functioned as they were. So programs uh, for training medical students have also been compromised as a result of this uh, pandemic. Uh, even going at the community level, uh, there has been a lot of stigma surrounding the, those patients with uh, found, being found COVID-19. Uh, are positive and also uh, we've been seeing even from the news and reading that uh, some of the patients have been running away from quarantine centers and uh, it's also been a challenge to follow up uh, uh, preventive measures in the different uh, uh, communities. And uh, if you look at Malau, especially one of the training sites being Mangochi here, being a tourist attraction center, currently even the tourism industry has been affected because most people are not flying in or they are not coming in. Uh, so that has also been an issue as a result of uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. 
now, most importantly, that we know the elderly and even the chronically ill, uh, even those people with NCD, they fall into that category of being uh, at risk of COVID infection. But however, as, as I talk, we don't have a clear structures where these people can be uh, can be placed so that they they are away from that risk of getting COVID-19 uh, infection. And uh, most importantly, also we noted that currently we are having a lot of uh, local transmission, but before this, we had a surge of uh, COVID-19 new infection. The time we got uh, some immigrants from South Africa. Now, is something to reflect on what, uh, that uh, during that time, was it a good decision to send them back home? Or should the sending be a bit delayed? Because the moment people came in from different countries, and uh, that's when we saw a surge of uh, a new infection in our country. So I think I had tried to highlight some of the questions that um, Need, we now need to be reflecting because we are not sure when this pandemic is going to start to go down, when it's going to end. So we can't continue to deprive certain category of people of the normal hepatitis they used to get. And still, it is important to follow on certain uh, uh, people in the communities and see what is the outcome. How else can we re-strategize our health service delivery? And uh, from there, I think uh, Dr. Patrick will take you through uh, focusing specifically uh, on Homer Mission Hospital and how they have specifically responded to this pandemic. Well, thank you, Dr. Patrick. Um, I think uh, let's proceed. And, um, you know, there are lots of possible questions. I think uh, understanding a little bit more, I'll come up with some of these, but I would really want people to add their questions into the question and answer uh, uh, space. I mean, um, I think you've raised lots of very useful issues. We'll come back to that. Let's give Dr. Patrick a chance to speak and then we'll, we'll take the questions that are there or um, we'll go to what I've got here. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Please welcome. Thank you for to presenting. Go ahead. Welcome. Um, yeah, I'll take you through the COVID response at the Homer Mission Hospital. As already said, it's one of the uh, training centers of family medicine. Uh, it's uh, under CHAM, which is the Christian Health Care Association of Malawi. Uh, it's um, a 250 bed hospital covering a immediate, um, uh, immediate catchment area of about 80,000 and a referral catchment area of about um, uh, 450,000. That's covering <coughs> um, revenue health centers, which differs to us. At the same, at the same time, it also overlook, um, oversee a number of health centers, which is affiliated uh, to the mission hospital, about uh, 10 of them, um, which are spread in different uh, districts. So our COVID response, um, uh, though it covers much of the hospital, but it also um, also cover uh, those health centers as well as the communities around us. Um, this, uh, our journey started in March 20, uh, March 2020, when we in, um, established the um, prepared, uh, disaster preparedness team. Um, and then this team is headed by the um, family medicine faculty and also has the other cadres, which um, include the uh, coordinator for the health centers, as well as the um, uh, health, uh, community health uh, team. Um, the main function was to organize as well as the coordinate the, the response. So in the, uh, in the same month, we managed to do uh, community awareness as well as um, um, we in, the, in the hospital among our um, patients and the staff. We also um, had to fundraise in order to uh, make the response effective. 
So we needed the, about um, $130,000. Um, um, we managed to get close to half of that. Uh, also helped us to uh, establish a number of hand washing stations. Um, also, okay, uh, and also we um, we also conducted a number of uh, um, uh, trainings in the centers and also visits just to orient them on the, this pandemic um, so that they can be ready. As the at this time we had not registered the cases as, uh, as, as as Malawi, we also uh, thought of limiting the traffic uh, by allowing only one guardian per patient. And to do that, we need to have a, a guardian badge, ID badge. So we are uh, uh, giving badge to every guardian. And also uh, we managed to distribute sanitizer to all uh, employees as well as all departments. Uh, in April, um, we started the, our screening using the local nurses, which, which we were uh, of duty. And uh, through, the, through that, we managed to get our first sustained case, which fortunately came out negative. Uh, we also um, um, adopted the use and as well as the uh, reasonable use of the PPs, uh, which enables us to be able to use the, the gowns and also to know uh, when to use which uh, sort of uh, PPs um, and the, in which departments. Um, again, we also implemented the social distancing in all hospital queues. Uh, and then in the, the same, uh, so in May, uh, we had um, now trainings of all clinical staff, uh, as well as the community health workers um, um, and the major chiefs of, um, of our community. And in these trainings, like for the uh, community health workers, like the which we call HSS, um, they were trained to be able to uh, screen uh, patients in the community and also to also give training to the community um, to be able to follow patients in the community as well. And the, one of the things that we are training, um, the HSAs as well as the major chiefs, we are to, to be able to know uh, which patients need to be uh, referred to, to the hospital or which patient needs to, uh, to stay at, the, at, the, at home. Uh, depending on the severity of the symptoms. As you can see, just go uh, back a little bit. Okay, so as you can see on the left, uh, there's a, a card there, which was given to all our chiefs, so that you can be able to identify if you, uh, it's, it's in the local language, but it shows some signs, uh, uh, which include temperature, um, whether somebody is coughing or is having shortness of breath. So up, up there, if you have a shortness of breath, he's coughing as well as he has got a high temperature, they are supposed to be given a mask and also be referred to the hospital uh, to be uh, taken care of. It. And if they have, only have cough and, uh, and, um, and temperature, but they don't have um, uh, shortness of breath, they are, uh, they are advised to be given a face mask and stay at home and call a number, uh, if they see any, uh, any worsening of the symptoms. So that's one of the things that we uh, had to educate the chiefs. Yeah, gone. Next. Yeah, so that's part of the trainings that uh, we, we, conduct, we conducted. Um, again, in the same month, we managed to obtain a number of equipment um, uh, to be used in the response, uh, like uh, infrared thermometers as well as the 12 additional oxygen concentrators. And also in the same month, we uh, were preparing the uh, hospital so that we can be able to do the testing uh, right here at the site. And also we completed the preparation of um, the COVID association watch, um, which 
uh, have two words with the eight bits each for male and female. Next. Yeah, that's just uh, an assertion of the isolation words that we have. Next. All right, so in June, it's when we had the, our first confirmed case. Um, this was a, a Martin Day case. Uh, due to, to the severity of the case, it was referred to a um, to Kamu Central Hospital, where the treatment center is. And fortunately, the welcome was good. Um, and the, again, that consequently we had the revenue staff, which were forced to go for mandatory quarantine. I think depending on the uh, guideline, which was that at, the, at that moment. Uh, fortunately, all of them were tested negative. And also we did the contact testing in the community and the, out of the five contacts, four of them came positive. Um, however, we had a challenge when we presented the results to them, they initially rejected and also chased the um, hepatitis. Uh, fortunately, later on when we go, went back and negotiated with them, they did understand uh, that we are there to work together with them. So currently we are, uh, they have accepted. Uh, in, in the same month, uh, in June, as a hospital, we procured a uh, fabric mask to be given to all staff, more especially those who are not in direct contact uh, with patients, uh, like those in uh, like ground laborers and those in administrative um, positions. Um, and also maybe if you are going out of the hospital, you could go put on the fabric mask. Um, again, uh, we also started the testing um, using the gene, uh, uh, gene expert machine, which uh, might take some, uh, close to one hour to have the results in the hospital. Yep, next. So in July, uh, uh, after seeing that there's a uh, um, rise in cases and also uh, evolving of the guideline at the national level, we had the various meetings with Ricardas uh, try to um, modify our guidelines and see how best we can respond. And that led to the integration of our COVID response to our routine pathway to make it a bit easier. Because initially it was, seems as if it was uh, an added burden, but uh, when we incorporated in the routine uh, pathway, we thought maybe people would look at it as a, a normal uh, thing. And that led to rede uh, redefining of different laws of different gardens. Um, and the, one of that is, was to task uh, shift uh, the charge system to the patient attendant, which uh, work uh, 24 seven. And then the um, initial evaluation of the patient who have been screened, we are done by the, uh, done by the OPD clinician and uh, which later on the OD, um staff um, evaluate the patient further in the isolation and then do the, the test. Uh, again, uh, when they come out positive, uh, we, st uh, 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 we still have to send them to come central hospital if there are severe cases, but if there are mild cases, we are sending them uh, to uh, sending them home for home isolation. Another thing that we have also adopted this month is um, a mask for everybody. So no mask, no entry in the hospital. Next. All right, so, so far we have registered a, um, quite a number of success. Uh, one thing that uh, um, I would say that our COVID uh, response team is very organized and uh, it's very committed. Uh, they do meet uh, oftenly and they proactively plan, uh, even anticipating some challenges that will come uh, so that when everything comes, uh, it's, it's, it's not as if we are uh, not ready for that. So that's quite has been, that has been a very uh, big advantage for us, and the, as of as as of now we still have uh, we have never had the outstroke of uh, PPE. Uh, that's a big plus. Um, but possibly maybe if we, the uh, the COVID code goes on, maybe that's when we have uh, uh, stock uh, stock out. Um, and currently, though we started the uh, people started the. Uh, we are not all that uh, um, ready to join the response, but now we have started seeing lots of the staff finding the management of the uh, COVID-19 response. Um, 
Again, we have also, uh, through the government, uh, we have seen a number of uh, insurance companies on, on mutual um, uh, putting all of us on the, uh, life insurance. And the government also has put the, uh, all the staff on the uh, risk allowance. And screening has also been um, quite a big success. Uh, since we started, uh, I can go. Since we started, you have uh, next. Since we started, we have uh, screened quite a number of uh, patient, patient. And the, that's just giving us how we screen our patients. Um, when they enter the gates, uh, they all have to get through the um, that the area where we have put the, where they have to stop. Some of them have to stop before. Uh, so, so there's one one meter apart before they can be screened. So that's how we do it. And then through this, uh, we have managed to screen about uh, forty three thousand in the uh, past three past three months. So can go ahead and start. Uh, for the first the past three months, um, and the, uh, through the screening, we have managed to uh, to pick about seven positive cases uh, from this uh, from screening. So that's one of the uh, uh, big big success. Um, there have been challenges. Uh, some of them we have now dealt with them, but uh, some are still ongoing. Uh, one of the ongoing challenges are uh, large number of respiratory cases without fever. Uh, now, the question always, it's a, it's, it gives us a dilemma to say whether we should test it or not. Uh, uh, with a limited testing capacity, because we have very few test kits. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, you have uh, some cases where you, uh, you test them at first and they come out negative. And whether to trust the first test and uh, send them to general or keep them in isolation sometimes has been a challenge. Because some uh, whom tested negative, maybe initial test, and then they don't test positive and the uh, next test. Now that becomes a challenge to say, let's test the first test and they send them to general. Again, uh, in terms of prevention, um, though we have said um, mask for everybody, but uh, for some patients, they can't afford to buy mask. And the, for the hospital to, uh, to give mask to every patient sometimes, uh, it will also be a very costly for the hospital. And um, yeah, community education has also been one of the challenge. Um, uh, looking at the, the fact that if you want to do uh, a community, um, if you want to gather people to tell them about the COVID-19, it's again uh, like uh, you are putting a lot of people uh, in one place there's no, then social distancing again is, is compromised. So that has been one of the challenges to, uh, to see how, what would be the effective way of uh, doing a community education. I look at most of them are not technologically uh, uh, connected. Again, um, one of the challenges that we have had was uh, if a staff tests positive, um, do we have quarantine facility for them? Uh, do, we have, um, do we have to provide meals for them? What other support should we give to them? And the, just recently, a week ago, uh, just one week ago, we had the one staff which he tested positive. Um, and now, uh, though we have identified the, uh, a facility where we can isolate them, um, we still have other things that we need to put in place. So that's one of the challenges that we are still uh, dealing with. Uh, we also had the challenges because, as I said, initially we were using the local nurses. And when the funding ran out, uh, we didn't know uh, now uh, how to proceed with um, uh, the tragedy. I think, he, fortunately, after some meetings, that's why we have agreed now to incorporate that into uh, a routine um, um, into routine uh, pathway. I think that's, that's, that's how, how, how we have dealt with that uh, problem. Uh, initially, we had, um, uh, we are depending mainly on our specialists uh, to see the suspected cases and also do the, um, take the samples. Uh, currently, after we have been incorporated this into the system, 
uh, we have seen that a, a number of people now also been capable of uh, taking samples and also uh, evolving the patients. So, so far, that's um, what I can say. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Bente, Madai, and Patrick. Uh, well done. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, I'm going to just go through some, uh, some comments and questions while I wait for others to share. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you asked the question, you know, this question about immigrants returning, was that the right choice? Um, what's, uh, what's your, your thinking? What's the local thinking? Is that a, a major political issue or is it just within the sort of academic circle that you're in? Uh, Mudai, perhaps you want to respond to that. Uh, is it a, what's the quandary? And I think that from my point of view or any, you know, in, in Africa, there's so much of migrancy. Uh, the option would have been to say to people, which might have saved us spreading it, don't come back, stay where you are and don't spread it. But how long and how do, how do we sustain that, that challenge? But uh, what, what, are the, what are the discussions like in, uh, in Malawi? Um, of course, it's not that clear that um, maybe people are saying it's attributable to politics, uh, but somebody who is in a medical field, I think, as I already said, as uh, readers in healthcare, mm -hmm. there are certain things I think we need to uh, reflect on or reflect upon as they happen. And also, because it's like almost everyone is waiting for us to get a, a direction in terms of uh, uh, as far as health issues are concerned. So I was looking at, um, was it a right decision to send them here or should they have been quarantined before they have been sent? But I know uh, it's beyond what I see and it's beyond what we, uh, there, there's much more beyond the tip of the iceberg. I think mm. it's sort of a multifactorial decision for, to arrive at that particular point. It could, there could be also a component of uh, politics behind that, but uh, I think- Ethical, it's, uh, ethical moral it's challenges, it's, it's, very laden. It's you know some of those difficult ethical cho choices you have to make. So I'm just curious, you know, Patrick, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's quite um, dilemma. I think he, a lot of people have said a number of things. Um, we have seen in social media people saying a lot of uh, things about. They think Sam says, I think it's a good choice because this is their home, they have to come back. Oh. Um, that's uh, one, well, one, one school of thought. Uh, oh. other, other people are saying, no, I think they would have wait. Um, and others, they say, maybe this was a political move because you understand, I think, around that time where uh, a time where we are having an election. So people felt that maybe the other part, uh, the other side of the team didn't want the election to go on. So they wanted to import more cases so that we are in a lockdown and we don't do it anymore. So that was a different school of thoughts. Um, so whether it's right or wrong, I think it, it all depends on... Um, <laughs> you, you, you're way, giving a political uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> the politicians want you to say, this is what we want you to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you've got to be prepared to put your neck somewhat on the block. What, what, yeah. Just, I, I, I'm just being, you know, I'm just, I think, you, you know, like Mudai says, uh, this is important. It's, it's about, uh, you know, people want direction and it's, it's difficult, mm -hmm. but it's not yeah. different than an ethical choice with the patient, the same ethical mm -hmm. choice at that higher level. And it, it yeah. would be an interesting discussion. But let's see if there are any other questions. I don't see any others. You know, in fact, I want to just mention to you that I'm hoping that you guys have done a great job. Uh, if we could get you all to write a small blog of about 700 to 1,000 words, 
and capture what you've actually presented in a blog for the Primary Health Care uh, Performance Initiative, which goes to a lot of very uh, you know, wide stakeholders. You've got the pictures, even a little bit of the audio, you know, make it up, you, you just need to write it. And then we'll look at making that work. So keep it in mind. And I think you might focus on a couple of these issues, uh, you know, instead of just giving the whole story, is talk about something that is quite different. I must say, when I listened, I, I got the impression, like you all said, that family physicians seem to be quite at the front of this and are very visible. I mean, you, you actually said it, Madai, people are expecting you to provide direction. Sounds like you're providing leadership and it's noticed. And I'm not sure in the pictures, I saw some politician looking people. So I said, oh, that's getting some attention. <laughs> <laughs> you must have shared something that was important. But nonetheless, I'm just curious about, you said, you know, you all are, you all are being recognized and providing management leadership support. How is that working in the, in the midst of teamwork? Um, what is the dynamics around that? You know, um, is your role being recognized or is there still contested territory? Um, how, how is that panning out? Yeah, I think that um, there are a lot of teamwork with the ministry. Uh, in the hospital, we work together with people from the Ministry of Health. Um, mm. They are We are only a very small department, so they are doing most of the work. Um, oh. So it's really a lot of teamwork. It's really um, grounded in what they do, and mm. we um, help them where possible. But it's, it's yeah. It's, it's, I, think, I think this is actually a very nice time for family medicine to show what we can mm. actually offer. Uh, nice. Because we are still quite new in Malawi, this mm. is really the, the time that we can show that family medicine has more um, knowledge also about public health, about we have more contacts in the health centers, so we mm. can combine a lot of things. And we That's can show that we are... Uh, more specialist uh, we, that we have a specialist approach and um, it, it's really recognized in the hospitals I think where we where we uh, have yeah. the registrars now yeah. and we really see a good yeah I, I hope that this really also works good for the future of family medicine. Well it sounds great I think you've shared lots of very useful interesting stuff it's there it's going to be a video available feel free to use it and uh, you know but I think that that itself is a very nice focus of the blog, or you know, if we were to talk of doing that blog, is what you've been able to achieve. So my question would be to you and, and the colleagues would be, um, have the people from the ministry recognized your value add yes. as opposed to other specialties? Yes, we can do that. We they they, they recognize yeah. it. Yeah, the, the blog you'll do, but I think that my question is, I think it'd be very useful to give in that blog um, a feedback on how do the decision makers, how are they seeing you differently? That would be based on what you've been able to show within the COVID, which is all the stuff that you've been able to show. I think that'd be a very good point, uh, if it were. Uh, is that how they're responding to you, that you are actually someone they value more than, than in fact the other specialties, especially in primary care? Yeah, I can see a nod yeah. from Patrick. So that's, yeah, that's good. Patrick can, can answer first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's good. All right. Well, um, yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, I think it, it has been a journey. Um, when the family medicine first come, came, I think there were a lot of executives uh, in, as well as uh, mm. uh, people didn't understand what it is. That's right. But I think they have seen um, the changes that we have. Uh, uh, brought uh, in our um, places where we are, both in Mangoja and in Koma. Mm. Now we have seen other colors in recognizing. Uh, we have just seen that uh, Malawi um, Medical Association, they are starting advocating for more family physicians. Wonderful. Like a, a recent memo that was sent to uh, to the Ministry of Health uh, on 20 July this year. Wow. July 20. This year, they have just That's, asked the Minister of Health. Yeah. They have just asked the Minister of Health to um, make sure that the more family physicians are available in all district hospitals. Wow! So that's a, a quite um, amazing. Yeah, you can see that. But well, the, the ones who promote, it's not like they are family physicians, but they are other cadres. 
Um, and when you say other cadres, you mean specialist cadres or medical ca- medical cadres. Yes. I'm curious about the nurses and the clinical officers, if you'll have in the country and community, other staff. How are they responding to you, to your leadership? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think he, I would ask in, my, uh, in our setter, in our setting, uh, like he, here at Goma, uh, you can see most, most of the things, uh, the family medicine, they, they are the ones who are leading. Even me, uh, we have seen the COVID response. The one who are chairing the COVID response are the, our faculty, um, and also even us as uh, um, registrars, we are also part of that. So people are really trusting us. Um, they have so much trust that we can move things and we can bring change. Because I think one thing that I've learned from us is that we encourage a lot of um, teamwork um, because they, they want to be encouraged. And they can see that we have um, a vision and we can help them to achieve what they want to achieve. So from that, I think they have lots of confidence in us, and they, they really think that we're going to achieve much better. Yeah. Well done, well done. I think that's great, and you'll need to share this good success stuff, you know, in small writing. Please do. Uh, we can even turn it into an article later. So I really appreciate Bente and the team, and I think Mudai and Patrick to share this. Let me ask a question. I think you might see on the question Q and A. Um, Patricia asks about talking test centers across. How many are they conducting tests across the country? Uh, do you want to share that, uh, um, Bente, I maybe? Or the Was it on the slides? Yes. All right. So it are 37 places that conduct the gene expert tests, and yeah. there are 14 um, places where they conduct other COVID tests. Right. Will you so, share yeah. the slides with me, and then I will put it on the on the on the on the same. Uh, I'll just share on the the recording as well uh, on the same uh, web page, so people can do that. That's fine. Don't worry. I think we'll we'll share that. It's probably information that you won't be able to put out. Right. But I'll I'll put out the information now. So let me just quickly go to the other question that Patricia asks. Oh, it, it's quarantine centers. I don't know whether you have that information uh, as the number of quarantine centers. And Megashri asks about, um, are these isolation quarantine centers you referred to well-staffed? I mean, are they struggling with staff? You'd mentioned food and other challenges. Is it landing up that even staffing is a problem? Um, I think there's a difference in the quarantine center and the isolation center. So the quarantine centers yeah. are the centers where they actually want to keep the people coming into the country. Um, mm. Those are not staffed actually with, I don't know how they're staffed, but I don't think there are, there, there are no health workers working there. Um, mm. And the isolation wards are then uh, specifically for um, the hospitals. Um, Though health centers sometimes also have um, COVID, a COVID room, so it depends on where you are, um, how they are, how they facilitate that. Uh, for our uh, hospital, I can say that we have um, uh, we have some troubles with our isolation ward um, in the way that there is normally a nursing schedule which pr- works works fine. Um, the clinician um, the clinician is more more of a difficult uh, schedule because it's, it's never made on time and um, people, especially in the beginning, people are really afraid entering the COVID ward. Um, mm. Now we see last week it's going a lot better. Uh, we now have struggles with that they are renovating our isolation work. We had an NGO who said, oh, um, we see that the COVID numbers go up, we will renovate the ward now, which of course it's nice to have a COVID ward who is, well, well, which is working better, but then mm. we didn't have any isolation ward for weeks. So that's also, it's mm. a challenge. It's always a, di- it's a difficult, um, I think it's difficult to say if, if it's good to renovate a ward while you already have the pandemic there. Um, yeah. But at the moment it, it's running. Um, and the, pay, the people that work there are then afterwards can go in quarantine. In, um, so yeah, it's, it's working for now. 
No, that sounds good. So your isolation beds, you mentioned, uh, you know, the six or seven beds per ward, male, female. Do you all have a, a PUI or patient under investigation, uh, a suspected patient being in separate wards um, no. as a, before testing, or you'll have good turnaround time for testing so you can actually make a decision, even in the OPD or emergency, yeah. that no, this person's positive, they are going in the ward? Yeah, that, that's still a point in, 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 in Mangochi, that's still a point of discussion. What we do now is for the people that are not that sick, we let them wait for the result outside um, or in, in a separate tent um, until the results are out. Um, but if they are really sick, we put them in isolation. And then um, if they are negative, that's always a discussion point, what to do at that time. But yeah. at the moment, we don't have two separate um, wards. Okay. They are, the, the management is trying to make awards for the suspects, um, yeah. but also for that, we're still waiting for, there's an NGO who's interested in renovating, but yeah, that's mm. going to take so much time again that I don't know if that will be finished before COVID will end. Mm. And it's always a decision between testing, turnaround testing times, you know, of testing yeah. times and your PUI beds. You know, the more, yeah. the longer your testing time becomes, the bigger the number of, of these, um, you know, suspected beds you need to keep. But I think that you'll, you're probably looking at the numbers and trying to get yourselves ahead of the game, which is really good. Um, I want to just quickly ask one or two questions and then we can close. I don't see any other questions. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, there was mention of visits to these uh, health centers. Uh, it seemed like education was focused on the clinical team, and these, I assume, were other cadres, nurses, and others in the setting of the clinics. Uh, do, do family physicians actually actively get involved in the education in community, in direct community engagement? Uh, I'm just wondering of the leadership that you'll demonstrate, does that extend out and is noticed by the community as well? Uh, I can say from Mangochi, um, the registrars all have their own health facilities where they go to once a week. Um, mm -hmm. And in the, health, in the health centers where they go to, they really work together to, get, to do health promotion and to see... In the community the health, as well. What, yes, what they need. Mm -hmm. um, but as we are such a small department at the moment, um, the, of course, the impact on a big, big level is... Um, yeah, it's not there at the moment. It's, it's still very local. No, yeah. I, I must be honest. I don't think you should be too anxious to extend your reach across country. You know, in a small setting like you have, to show the, the ideal you want to build, even if it's small scale, and make it work. And you're already having evidence. People are seeing things. You just have to find ways to capture that, that evidence in ways that you can say this can work if you know you scale it up. But I think it's great work that you're doing. And I must be honest, it's something you do have to share. Um, I think even these little nuances uh, that you've mentioned about one week, uh, one day a week out in the clinic, the role there. And I think in the context of COVID, it sounds like really wonderful stuff. And I think we, we really want to see you not only as family physicians being strongly skilled in supporting hospitals, but really making a dent on the community and quite clearly you all are doing great stuff in that space. Um, so well done to all of you. I see one Thank more you. question popped up. Let me just quickly see. Anonymous says um, a request of uh, 130,000 was needed, 60,000 received. Uh, this means you cannot buy. Uh, do you buy less or do less or are you still fundraising? I hope he's going to be coming with a big fat check. So let's answer the question. <laughs> Anonymous doesn't want us to chase him. <laughs> yeah, um, that meant that we had to scale down some of the things that we planned. And also um, uh, as to how long will, will that take us? Yeah. So, um, so currently we prioritized what you, we thought were most important, uh, things like EPs, so, so you are prioritizing based um, on what you got, but you can, you can, you, you can, you can, you need more. 
So, Patrick, we know that you're doing the best you can. You always will. African family physicians always do that. But I think what you do is find time, send me a list. We'll put, pop it on there. Hello? And if anybody wants to raise funds, um, the <laughs> list is going to be there of what you can buy for the Malawian colleagues. So, to Anonymous, pull Hello. out your checkbook. We're waiting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Patrick, let, let, let's leave it at that. It's a nice note to end off on, and I think that we're really open to it. So put out your, your, you know, your, um, you know, some things that you need uh, on that as well. And I please, we'd like to have a conversation after this about that blog. Let's take some of the stuff you've written or presented, turn it into a little bit of a write-up, and we're going to oh, put right. it in on the line for that blog. That hopefully other people so. Uh, Hank says thanks and I want to thank you all I want to thank our listeners for joining us Um, it's been a really wonderful session I hope that you've liked it and enjoyed it Uh, and I must say once more it's been wonderful to listen to all the good work that you guys are doing Um, so on behalf of Afro PHC Wonka Africa I want to thank you uh, Bente, Udai, Patrick and your colleagues behind you thank you very much and uh, to all our listeners Yes, welcome and thank you. And you'll get a chance next time. We'll have another time. So <laughs> good for you. Thank <laughs> Take you care very much. And bye-bye, everyone. Remember, we've got a webinar next week. Um, it'll be about the Eastern Cape in South Africa, where things are very hot as well. And I hope that becomes a lesson for others in Africa to see a little bit of war that's going on in different parts of South Africa as well. And I hope you learn from that. So keep tabs. Join us next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Yes, I'm